it'd be amazing to give the biggest round of applause you can to get Joey on stage. Here he is. First of all, that was amazing. Thank you. It was amazing, wasn't it? It was um, just what a great kind of variety of songs, and your voice is absolutely spectacular. So that's me, fan first. Um, Appreciate it. So I've got a few questions to ask you first, and then we're going to get some questions um, for everyone out here, if that's okay. Absolutely. Um, number one. Um, so you've you've already played a US tour. You're in the middle uh, of a European tour. So you've you're used to playing gigs. Um, we'd, I'd love to know what your absolute favorite place to play a gig has been so far. Wow, there's, uh, it's hard to just pin down one, truthfully. Um, LA. Sorry? LA. <laughs> <laughs> L uh, yeah. <laughs> LA is special because it's my home. Um, but I will also say that I've had <clears throat> the chance to have some extraordinary experiences playing music in Japan. And um, I, I see lots of similarities between different cultures and the way they listen to music. This is one characteristic of certain audiences. <clears throat> um, they listen with big ears. It's like you can look out into a crowd and see people um, really actively becoming part of the music and interacting with it on a feel, hear level, you know? Um, much less like running to the bar to go get a drink, you know? Yeah. But then that also like um, brings up a, a certain kind of challenge, if you will, to interact with an audience because um, it's also my desire to get people to come out of their shells. And so there's no, like each crowd is different. It's like uh, there, there's a great, that's a great characteristic about the Japanese crowd, listening with, a big with big ears, but then just culturally too, it takes a little bit more to just be like, all right, like you can let go and and clap along or do something weird or whatever, you know. And it's different for every audience. I, I could go through each country. Each country has has different customs and ways. Sure. So you, you said do something weird there. Has anything weird ever happened in a crowd? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, yes. I uh, the first time that I went over to Japan to play, I went over with an amazing artist named Maki, um, who I was playing with. And um, I would play a few of my songs in his set. And I'd, we had, were collaborators. And um, Maki's an amazing performer. And he went out into the crowd. And he got the entire crowd in a club to s like sit down on the floor. So it was like a whole like you know 800 people just sitting on the floor, like whistling his song, Birds of a Feather. And uh, that's one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. It was wonderful. Yeah, it sounds wonderful and weird. So yeah, <laughs> awesome answer. Um, so on the flip side then, have you ever played any gigs which uh, have, have just, it's been the absolute worst or it's been really, really strange? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I, I think that crowds are very smart. And uh, I think sometimes they might not even be aware of how smart they are. Um, maybe some of it is in my own mind. But for instance, I remember being on a tour. We were chasing a bus, which means like if you're opening for another band that's in a bus, they drive through the night to get from place to place. While the band that's opening sleeps in the town you play in and then chases the bus the next day. So while the band, the bigger band, is waking up in the town and kind of having their day, the other band's trying to catch up to this bus that drove all through the night, you know? And so um, what that might breed is like an upper respiratory infection um, <laughs> when you've been chasing a bus for a long time. And so um, uh, I remember one show in, what city was that in? It was in Des Moines, Iowa. And I was uh, not feeling well. And I, I was like, man, how am I going to do this show? I could barely talk. And so I remember playing for a crowd, didn't know who I was. And I'm like, I had 40%. And it was one of those shows where it's like each show on the tour, I felt like I won over the crowd. And that one 
for whatever reason, they knew. It's like they knew. And I remember just looking at the front row, and there was a guy who just went like, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, so, yeah, that's the memory that sticks out, is that guy in Des Moines yawning. Um, well, yeah, I mean, fair enough. Let's hope he's seen you again and didn't yawn that time, I'm sure. Absolutely. I'm, sure I'm coming back to Moines. Yeah, you should, you should. Um, so you've you released music on your own um, via kind of collaborations in the past, uh, but Inside Voice, which is your debut solo full-length record, uh, I mean, it's out, and first of all, congratulations. It's amazing. Um, second of all, how did you approach this record, and did it feel different to the stuff you've done in the past? Um, well, it's it's my first full length record, so I don't have too much from the past to kind of draw upon. It's it's a wonderful opportunity to kind of come out of the gate with something. Um, while I was making the record, I actually had a, a knee injury playing basketball, and ended up while I was in recovery, um, I ended up making another EP while I was making the record. I thought the record was almost done, and then. Um, I ended up making this weird, like, um, basketball therapy love song EP while I was making the record. So, um, yeah, it it uh, it took it took many many twists and turns. It, it, it took me about four years to make um, because I had that sort of detour. Took a little detour while I was making it, but um, you know, the common thread in it truly for me was. Uh, thinking about what it means uh, to strive to write a classic song or it's a song that's timeless, a song that um, people of all ages love, people of all races, all genders, um, that sees no boundaries and um, that someone might want to sing with their child in 40 years. You know, it's just trying to approach that mindset. It's like, it, it's that's a very hard, high bar to set, and I'm I'm not saying that I hit that bar, but what I'm saying is that I look to people who have done that, people like Carol King, people like Bill Withers, people like Marvin Gaye, and they were kind of my guiding lights for the record, and so a lot of it was really about the songwriting process. Wow, that's a pretty stunning answer, and and w when you're, I guess when you're, you say you take influence from those kind of massive artists, do you? When you're in that um, creative process, are you listening to them on repeat, or yeah, how how does their influence kind of I don't know how do you get that in you when you're songwriting? Right. Yeah, I think uh, there are specific times when I do listen to one song and be like, okay, how can I kind of emulate the form or or um, use it as inspiration, you know? Um, but all in all, it's like those songs are songs we've all been listening to our whole lives. You know, I bet we could all sing "Lean on Me." right now. So it's like they that kind of information has already seeped into our culture and um that's how I kind of interacted with those particular artists. Amazing. Um so that brings us lovely uh and nicely onto bagels. Hey, yeah. Uh, yes. yeah. Um specifically so we have obviously got bagels here tonight. Um, Great. Yeah. Um what what is your ultimate dream bagel? Wow. Okay, maybe I have some controversial opinions here. <laughs> to me, tomato on a bagel is like n is a non-starter. I'm not into the tomato on a bagel. That's a no go. I'm very into uh, raw onion on a bagel. Um, I'm, 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 I love raw, uh, red onion, raw red onion. Um, there's a bagel spot in Los Angeles called Wexler's that has a very innovative technique. They put the capers underneath the locks. So you have bagel, cream cheese, capers, locks on top. Because you get the capers rolling off. It's not a good, it's not a good thing. Yeah, no one wants yeah, capers it's not, rolling off. Not a good thing. Yeah. So um, I also definitely need uh, some combination of like, you know, like an everything bagel is is pretty much the go-to, although a great egg bagel, also fantastic. Um, and here's the number one rule, too. It's like, I don't think your bagel necessarily needs to be, like, all hipstered out. Like, 
you know, like your $15 bagel. Like basically number one on the power rankings of bagels is anything hot. Anything hot wins. Seriously, you can go to the worst bagel place in the world. If it's out of the oven, it'd be better than the hipster bagel. That's a quote, so thank you. Ask for what's hot. What's hot? It might be it might be the like cinnamon raisin like you know what I mean like it might be the weird the weird one it'll win. Awesome, very good, thank you. Um, I love an egg one myself, but there we are. Um, I think it's time to hear less of me and more of you guys. So we'd love to open up for some questions. Maybe you can tell us your favorite bagel filling and then your question. Uh, do we have anything? That's an office icebreaker. We have a lady wearing red over here. Um, Hold on one second, we've got a mic coming to you. There we are. Um, I love a good salmon and cream cheese. Um, yeah, classic. But, like, through listening to your records, like the Game Winner EP and the most recent record as well, Inside Voice, I kind of feel that there's like a weird, like a, not weird, but a strong sense of like family coming through in your songs. So it's like, like always a thing that six you're writing like obviously in stories as well it kind of feels like a generational kind of thing coming through there so is that something you're actively putting in your music that's an awesome comment <laughs> and question um speaking of which uh my sister is here she just flew over from los angeles and so hey. it's being a family my sister julia nickerson is here and i'm stoked about it um yeah there's there's definitely familiar influence. I mean, on, in a lot of ways, in so many indirect ways, in the way that you're raised, in the way that you just become you, you know? It's like, I wanted this record to be <clears throat> as much authentically me as possible. So indirectly, I am so much a product of my upbringing and my family and their influence on me. Um, there's also a song on the record that I wrote about my grandmother, and that's that's a very direct influence. And um, that song is is very special to me because it yeah there, there's actually a few f familiar moments. So there's that one, which is a song that I wrote about my grandmother and um, who was Polish and a Holocaust survivor and growing up as a boy from Los Angeles with someone from a whole nother world, you know, and um, being kind of amazed and perplexed at her ways and her customs, but being so um, thoroughly, like, enveloped in her love, which was greater than anything um, that I've ever felt. And um, along with that, there's also an interlude on the record called Down the Middle, and on that track, um, I used the audio from a uh, VHS cassette that my dad had taken with his camcorder of a basketball game when I was six years old. And you can hear the voices of my sister and of my mom on the track saying, my, my mom would go, down the middle, Joe, down the middle. <laughs> because it'd be just like a, this crazy scrum, you know, on the, on the court. And she was like, if someone just dribbled down the middle and went to the whole, it's like, then we were six years old, you know? Um, and so, yeah, there, there is also actual voices of family on the record. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Amazing. Any more questions? We've got one at the back there. Um, so my favorite bagel is uh, from Bagel Bake at 2 a.m. on Brick Lane. You should check it out. I've, I've been there. Definitely. Oh, it's been oh, there. Well I've been there. Solid performance. I'm, I have controversial opinions about that oh place. Oh, my. <laughs> Shall I hand the mic back now? Yeah. <laughs> um, I just want to say that was a fantastic performance. That was really, really wonderful. Thank and you. thank you so much for coming and being in our office. Um, but also, um, over the years, you've collaborated with quite a few people. I just wanted to know who you've worked with that has been uh, the, uh, the best to work with or, or the most influential to you or, yeah, the, your best collaboration, your favorite collaboration? Um, I've been so fortunate to make music with my friends. And my friends are my biggest influences. Um, 
I've been fortunate enough to be a part of Wolfpack and all of those guys um, influence me so much uh, from the way they play their instruments to the way they write songs. And um, I also have um, been a part of an amazing community in Los Angeles also. Um, people like, I mentioned Maki before, um, also some people that you should look up, people like Pegasus Warning, who's incredible, Nia Andrews, who is amazing. Um, when you have friends that um, are also brilliant musicians, they become your muses. Because when I'm writing, I will think like, or pretend almost that I'm like performing the song for one of them or the idea of them, you know? And um, then I actually do. Because, you know, if I have a song I just wrote, I'm like, man, this is a really, I just wrote a song of, about basketball as a metaphor for love, like this is weird, you know? And then I play it for someone and they're like, man, that's, that's great, that's great. Maybe you should, you know, shorten the second verse. I'm like, oh, great. It's like constantly workshopping. And um, so, yeah, it's, and it's not really a competitive thing. It's, it's really a, a supportive thing and I'm, I've been so fortunate for that. So I would, I would list them as, as the most influential on me. Brilliant. We have time for one more. We've got one at the back. Uh, oh, sorry. Have we got? Did I miss someone? We've got one here. Fantastic. Oh, is someone else? No. Was it? Did you have a question? Yeah, yeah please. Hi. Yeah, I was just. I wanted to ask you as an artist. How do you feel about the, I guess, playlist-driven uh, kind of culture that we live in, in the way that people tend to consume music now, and the pressure that that puts on artists to maybe make a song that gets on New Music Friday as opposed to getting people to listen to the record from start to finish? And uh, what were the controversial opinions about Bagel Bake? As well? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, my controversial opinion about Bagel Bake is that the bagel that I had was, was cold and felt like it was like two days old. It's got to be hot. I would, love to be hot. I would love to have the salt beef bagel and understand. I really do. I still haven't had it yet. So I will return one day. I know that, I know Amy Winehouse used to go there. That's cool. Um, uh, as far as uh, playlisting, I think it's just kind of like our modern reality, you know? Um, and the al you know, the albums are there for people to listen to if that's what they want. The good news about playlisting is it's almost sort of like the brand new version of the radio. And it is a bit, you know, how it all, like how the, how the sausage gets made or whatever, how it gets on the playlist, how that's still all kind of a bit mysterious and strange. But, um, you know, if you go back to, and even now with radio, it's like you need seven figures to get a song on the radio. So now it's this whole other um, way of kind of, potentially having your music reach a lot of people. And I know people who have been, you know, without a label, without much marketing power, honestly, sort of put a song out there and for whatever reason, the Spotify's of the world or whatever, they kind of like someone, they had a playlist angel, you know, and the playlist angel put it on the playlist and it got out to all these people. And all of a sudden, they saw like a few extra bucks in their bank account, or they had a few extra people follow them on, you know, Twitter or whatever. So, I th I think like people still listen to music. People are still listening to music. I can't see that ever changing. Um, and I think that uh, the more ownership that artists can take in what they do, um, you know, the more chance they sort of have of. Um, being able to sustain their art. And I, I see it as, as, I see it as positive, really. Um, not that I wouldn't be nostalgic for like the golden age of records, you know? It's like I would have loved to have gone to the record store to find the new Beatles album 
you know, and, and ingest it that way. But the good news is, is that we have the entire history of recorded music on our phones now. It's like you used to need a U-Haul to, to have it. Now it's just on our phones. So, yeah, it's weird. Digital music's weird. But overall, I think we're, I think we're gonna be okay. That's great news. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Joey, thank you so much for you coming for the band as well. It was it was such a treat having you here. Um, yeah, the band is crazy. Amazing, amazing. Yeah. Um, good luck tomorrow. Um, for those of you who uh, have a, a free evening, please go. Uh, Islington Assembly Hall, I'm sure it's going to be amazing. So massive thank you. And thank you all of you for coming as well. And uh, yeah, what a special evening. Thank you for having me. Cheers. Safe travels, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.